I've been pastoring a church in Hull, Kingston Evangelical Church, for about 18 years. And you might be able to guess that I wasn't born in Hull. I've been came from over the water. My wife is English. She was from West Yorkshire. And uh, we have a, a lovely little church. And uh, we're anxious to see God work there, as I'm sure you are, and your churches as well. So um, what I want to uh, share with you a little bit about this morning, uh, you know, we all know, I, I trust we all believe that all of God's word is true and therefore important. Uh, but it seems to me when God describes himself in his word, that's of particular importance to us. So when okay. Jesus, so when Jesus says, I am meek and humble in heart, uh, that's, a ve that's a very important statement. Um, and if we stop to think about it, it's really amazing, you know, that the great God of the universe, the one who has all power, the one who is all wise, uh, is humble. <laughs> you know, uh, our experience of powerful people in this world uh, doesn't usually go along with humility. <laughs> and to think that God is humble, um, it, it's amazing. Uh, so when we read in 1 John, uh, he who says he abides in him, that is Christ, ought himself so to walk as he walked, we know that we are to be humble. That is part of a huge part of our calling. That's what Jesus says he is. Uh, the problem is that even after conversion, though we have been changed, the old little uh, saying there is true, we're not what we once were, uh, but we're not what we will be. Uh, and so we've been changed, but nevertheless, in one of those uh, holy paradoxes of the Christian life, as Luther says, we're saint and sinner. We're, we're sinners saved by grace. And so that means we have this ongoing battle with sin. And Galatians talks about it, you know, the flesh warring against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And, and that's a description of the Christian life from beginning to end in this world. We never cease that battle. Um, we'll never be able fully and completely to follow Christ's example. Um, I, I don't think uh, really probably anything remotely <laughs> resembling it really. Uh, although some Christians come closer than others, uh, some seem to come extraordinarily close. There are godly men like uh, Robert Murray McShane who had a powerful impact on people just because it was so evident that he was such a godly, humble man. Um, Christ's humility, um, many acts of humility in Jesus' life, obviously, he grew up in this world, a sinless divine being growing up in a sinful world, in a family, as a little child. I often think about what his relationships with his brothers and sisters must have been like. Um, submitting to baptism by a, a, a sinner, um, receiving insults and abuse from people throughout his life and ministry, uh, tempted by the devil, the agony of the garden, betrayed by Judas, denied by Peter, and then on the cross where in some mysterious way his father uh, turns away, he suffers the wrath of God there for us. Uh, surely all of this is great acts of humility, but I wonder if the greatest act was before it all happened, when, when the triune God made that decision in eternity past that Jesus would come, that the Son would come and become uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And it's hard for us to come to grips with just how much of a humbling experience that had to be because we have never seen the pre-incarnate glory of Christ. And so we can't quite really fathom the, the depth to which he humbled himself to come. Uh, and so while every minute of his earthly life was in some sense humbling, I think that was the greatest act of humbling to make that decision to come. Um, often think about his life in the world. There must have been many times in which he saw things, he observed things uh, that were deeply grievous to him that he was repulsed by. Um, and, you know, we know 
sometimes that can happen to us. We encounter something that is degrading or very, very vile and sinful, and we're repelled by it. Well, imagine, <laughs> multiply that by infinity. Jesus had that experience. He must have had it often in those years of his life, even before the cross. Um, now, we know that Jesus had no need to be humbled. Uh, he had no inward temptation, no inward inclination to sin uh, as we do, uh, but we are in need of humbling because we battle with pride, uh, even as converted people. And if we don't take the initiative in humbling ourselves, God is well able to do that for us. Um, and obviously he does that anyway, no matter what we do. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the uh, Puritan writer, preacher, Richard Sibbs. And one thing that he's very famous for is this little uh, treatment he did on the, the bruised reed. I think there's a book of his uh, on that, with that title put out by the banner. And uh, in a sense, we are all bruised reeds. Uh, and, and Sibs used that figure of bruising to describe the humbling that God needs to do of his people. Um, and Sibs said that we all need this bruising, uh, not just the least spiritual among us, but all of us. And perhaps maybe the most spiritual need the most humbling. Ever notice how sometimes the most godly and humble and wonderful Christians have the most difficult, difficult lives. And uh, that's perhaps one of the reasons why they are <laughs> such godly, Christ-like Christians. Um, and I think one of the great uh, tricks of the devil is sometimes we don't recognize pride when it's there. It's kind of lurking in the background and all of a sudden some word comes out, some action comes out which is just motivated by pride. Uh, and so Sib says God needs to be bruising us, humbling us on a more or less regular basis or else pride will take over. And it seems to me that one of the ways he does this is in our battles with uh, sin, uh, the world, the flesh and the devil. Uh, we have that ongoing battle. McShane said he knew quite about that battle uh, John Newton talks about it in a wonderful hymn uh, that some of you will be familiar with, I'm sure, just a, a couple of verses of it. Um, he says, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part, speaking of God's dealings with him. And then he goes on, and then as though God were speaking, saying to him, these inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy, that thou mayest seek thy all in me. Um, when we have some sin that we seem to be battling with, uh, it can be immensely frustrating, uh, even to the point of despair. How can I be struggling like this? I'm supposed to be a Christian. I'm supposed to have victory. I have the Holy Spirit. Why am I struggling like this? Um, and this is one of the ways I think God humbles us, as Newton is saying there in his, in his hymn. Uh, the famous Welsh preacher Daniel Rowland uh, made a wonderful, a wonderful statement one time about an important goal in his life as a Christian. He said he wanted to be able to believe without presuming and to repent without despairing. I thought that was a remarkable statement. Uh, uh, in insight into the Christian life. Why repent without despairing? Well, because of this struggle, because of this struggle, and you can almost despair at times, and we hear it sometimes in some of the prayers that we pray in this, in this prayer meeting, people struggling with not being what they want to be, what they believe God wants them to be, and, and it can be despairing. Uh, and uh, And Roland recognized that and wanted to be free of that. Um, well, one of the reasons God lets us go through all these things, I believe, not the only reason, I'm sure, but one of the reasons is he's in the process of making him, making us like himself, conforming us to the image of his son. And so he's, that means he's making us humble. And none of us, by the way, are naturally humble. Some people seem more humble than others, but none of us are naturally humble. Uh, and we need to be humbled. And we have this battle with pride. 
And so he uses our struggle uh, with pride to humble ourselves, to humble us. And so he accomplishes gracious purpose in that wonderful way. And it, in a sense, makes sense out of what we do here in this prayer meeting. Uh, in our prayers, one of the things we're praying for largely is revival. We want to see God visit the nation again in revival. Been over a hundred years since it's been a major revival. It's no wonder things are as bad as they are. Uh, Lloyd-Jones was right. If it weren't for revivals, the church would have been dead long ago. Uh, re revivals come and need to come because the church inevitably declines. It doesn't have to, but it does, time after time. So in our prayers, we're praying for revival. And when we're doing that, of course, we're praying for something we clearly, profoundly do not deserve. And so we're praying for grace. And doesn't Peter remind us that God gives grace to the humble? And so it all comes around to the end that God is humbling us that he might be more gracious to us. So let's uh, not be discouraged, keep on praying, however difficult we may feel things are in our own lives and in the nation as a whole, God is using all of that to bring about his gracious purposes. And we trust that one of those will be revival. None of us may live to see it, uh, but I believe God will answer those prayers in due time. Amen. <laughs>